It's not enough to just survive something. That's not the point of life. You've got to thrive. You've got to feel happy. A modern, progressive woman of colour at the heart of the British royal family. Was it ever really going to work out? Oh, snap. Is this a bit of drama? Is it about to get spicy out here? And it did. She was supposed to be the breath of fresh air that would modernise the monarchy. But could anyone have prepared for this kind of royal scrutiny? As naive as it sounds now, I did not have any understanding of just what it would be like. Marrying into the royal family, you don't have freedom of opinions, you don't have freedom of your emotions. It's the British stiff upper lip, never complain, never explain. <laughs> Then came the relentless onslaught from the tabloid press. It's been pretty devastating to see how she has been treated in the media and the public. English media coverage of the royals is savage. If you just listen to the press, she's aggressive, she's, she's rude, she's snarky, she's bitchy. This is British racism. This is what it looks like. Meghan Markle's cameo inside the royal family has like been watching the sequel to Get Out. I'm like, what are you doing? You're in the sunken place, you need to leave. But now that they have walked away, what will they do with their newfound freedom? The next step for Megan should be whatever the f she wants. This may look like just another royal wedding. But when Meghan Markle marries Prince Harry in May 2018, it feels different. You've got, for the first time in history, a woman of colour marrying into the royal family. She's American, she's a feminist, she's a woman who's self-made. As people of colour in Britain, we were so hopeful. <laughs> this was a defining moment. Harry and Meghan were really driving the monarchy forward into the 21st century. It felt like we were given a seat at the table. This is something that will be so important to Britain forever. The ceremony has all of the pomp and pageantry, but with a Meghan twist. The Kingdom Gospel Choir from London are invited to sing. It showed that the royal family were being more inclusive, that they were thinking about the nation that they rule over. Being up there, I felt that we were standing up for something and we were symbolic of something that people could feel proud of. It was just incredible, and, and we felt so proud mm. to have been a part of all of that. A choir of colour was a part of the history of the United Kingdom. Meghan Markle has married her prince. As a royal duchess, she'll live happily ever after. In fairy tales, this is where the story ends. But this is no fairy tale. I don't think Meghan could have possibly known that she was entering a country which wasn't necessarily going to accept her and a family which is so dysfunctional. This was never going to be the fairy tale. This nonsense that all our, us girls, you know, have pumped into our heads. What does life have in store for Meghan? She was doing well as a television actress, but now she has a new job. She's the Duchess of Sussex, a senior member of the British royal family. What does a senior member of the royal family actually mean? Let's take it back a step. Unless you live under a rock, you'll know Harry's grandmother, Queen Elizabeth II. And after her, the family are ranked in importance, based on who gets the throne next. First up is Harry's dad, Prince Charles, followed by brother William and his kids. In at number six is Prince Harry. One little known fact is his name is really Henry. As working royals, Harry and Meghan are paid to represent the Queen in Britain and abroad. But take off that tiara and put up the umbrella. 
a lot of the time it's not just the weather that's dull. It's clear from her engagement interview that Meghan didn't grow up knowing much about the British royals. As naive as it sounds now, mm. having gone through this learning curve in the past year and a half, I did not have any understanding of just what it would be like. My name is Grant Harold, and I was a former butler to Prince Wales, Duchess of Cornwall, and Princess William and Harry. To be a member of the royal family, you, you have to be willing to change, to change everything. Your lifestyle, to a degree, your personality, everything. Your life is very much pre-planned. She couldn't then just turn around to one of her friends as she would have done in the past and said, oh, let's meet for lunch tomorrow. As a royal, you say goodbye to all of that. Meghan says goodbye to spontaneity and hello to life at the top of British society, where even though it's the 21st century, social class is very important. When a lot of uh, British people are meeting each other for the first time, they're doing a bit of a size up and they're going, uh, where's this person from? Where did they go to school? Uh, are they middle class? Are they working class? My name is Julie Montague, uh, also Viscountess Hinchingbrook, and I married into British aristocracy 17 years ago. One of the weirdest things I had to get used to at first, I wanted everybody to call me Julie. And the older generation would call me Lady Hinchingbrook. And I remember someone saying to me, that's what they want to call you, don't correct them. The royal family is the fabric and the aristocracy is the fabric of British history over here and they want to keep those traditions upheld. Which means Meghan has to accept a never-ending list of rules. To start with, know your place. Imagine having to curtsy to your in-laws. There was a lot of criticism about how she would walk ahead of Harry on engagements because we're used to seeing royal wives be quite subservient and take a few steps behind their partners. I think there was international headlines because she'd closed her own car door and that's not what's expected of women in the royal family. It's someone's job to close that door, okay? She ruined someone's life that day. What is she going to try to do? Sweep her own room? Get out of here. It's not just car doors. Meghan will have to relearn all the things she thinks she knows. My name is Kay Dilday. I am American and I married a British man from the aristocratic classes of the UK. I began to realise that there are some very different ways that they handled themselves and the things that they did. She's got to kind of know the correct way to walk with grace and decorum. You've also got to know that how to sit down correct as a lady. The royal family is very, very particular about their traditions and their protocols, down to working out which fork you need to use. There's a fish plate, there's a fish knife, there's grape scissors. All of these things were things that I hadn't encountered before. They do keep to these rules in, in private because the Queen is very much a stickler for tradition. If you said to me, can you pass me the salt and you're across the table, I couldn't just take the salt and reach over. It's little things like that that no one told me beforehand, and I highly doubt anybody would have told Megan. It's easy to feel as if you are an other, and you can feel that people are judging you. If you get one little bit of royal protocol wrong, it will be read as proof of your inerrant unworthiness. This is all before Meghan even opens her mouth. The use of words signals where you kind of are in this class system that this country still actually has. It would have been fine for Meghan to say basil or herbal tea. It's just a different pronunciation. That's OK. What's not OK? Toilet. For example, you would never in the household, uh, you, know, you wouldn't turn around to somebody and say, I'm going to use the toilet. It's the traditional word is, is loop. Pardon? Can you believe that? I know. It's sorry. Did you know that? <laughs> you, you'd be like, sorry? Have a good day. Yes, that's lovely, isn't it? Have a good day. You wouldn't say, have a good day. You'd be uh, very much, how do you do? Megan must really love Harry because it's a lot of work. 
Becoming a royal also means limiting her online presence. As a millennial, social media played an important part in how Meghan voiced her opinions and connected with fans. As a royal, she has to shut down her social media accounts and lifestyle blog. But there are signs Meghan's not ready to become a Stepford royal. The palace website declares her to be a proud feminist, a first for the family. That was quite remarkable for the royal family, you know, this institution based on traditionalism and, and core values, and suddenly here is the new Duchess of Sussex, a feminist. This was someone who was not about to just fall in line, and I think that's something to be, like, commended. It's clear Meghan has strong ideas about the kind of royal work she wants to do, and she's not waiting to be told how to do it. For me, it's very important to hit the ground running. You'll often hear people say, well, you're helping women find their voices. And I fundamentally disagree with that because women don't need to find a voice. They have a voice, they need to feel empowered to use it, and people need to be encouraged to listen. Very quickly, stories start appearing in the tabloids that Meghan taking her own approach is not going down well with palace staff. They didn't like the fact that she was up at 5 a.m. sending emails or she didn't like to be addressed with any formal titles. And they didn't like the fact that things were changing very quickly within the firm, simply because one, in their eyes, commoner had married in. How dare this lucky black woman, how dare she not be grateful? You should recognize that they're better than you and that you're lucky and do it their way. She's basically being cast as like the uppity black woman who has ideas about her station, who doesn't want to conform. We're trained by the way that the media casts her to think of Meghan as an invader. It's not going to be openly racist, but it's this idea that she doesn't fit. And that's one of the ways which racism plays out in the mainstream media today. Coming up, how Meghan learned to speak up from an early age. If things are wrong, and there is a lack of justice, and someone needs to say something, and why not me? But finds herself silenced. The Royal Highness, take one. Growing up in LA, when Meghan plays princesses as a kid, okay. she gets to say and do whatever she wants. As she'll learn later, real princesses are taught to keep their opinions to themselves. But Meghan is brought up to challenge the status quo. I know it's become a dirty word now, but she was woke before the word was. Meghan's progressive values echo her mum, Doria's. My mom's amazing. My mom is a yoga instructor and a social worker, and she's got a nose ring and dreadlocks, and she's super free spirit and laid back. Her black mum exposed her to ideas because she's a person that knows what it's like to live at the margins of society. That was Doria's thing, to always make Meghan aware of the wrongdoings in society and people that aren't as blessed as she was. And Meghan would always ask her mum, well, what can I do to help? Young Meghan is a budding activist. At the age of 10, she takes part in her first peace protest. OK, I'm Meghan. Um, I was... And the following year protests sexism on a TV commercial for dish soap. The gloves are coming off. Women are fighting greasy pots and pans. You know, truth be told, at 11, I don't even think I really knew what sexism meant. I just knew that something struck me internally. Meghan writes to Procter & Gamble, asking them to change the script from women to people. Women are fighting and greasy it works. And people are fighting greasy pots and pans with... Most 11-year-olds aren't thinking about those big issues around racism and sexism, and it, it speaks to her character. It really set up the trajectory for me to say, if things are wrong and there is a lack of justice and there's an inequality, then someone needs to say something. And why not me? How does Meghan, the child activist, become Meghan, the TV star? <laughs> Meghan's dad is an Emmy award-winning lighting director. Extreme close-up. He works on a show called Married with Children. So every day after school for 10 years, that's where I grew up. After catching the acting bug, she studies theatre at Northwestern before taking on Hollywood. 
a few small parts follow, including Hot Girl in the Ashton Kutcher classic, A Lot Like Love. Between acting jobs, Megan works as a freelance calligrapher. And it's actually quite lucrative. <laughs> then she gets a job as a briefcase girl on Deal or No Deal. In 2011, she marries her long-term boyfriend, Trevor Engelson. The marriage lasts two years. Megan finally gets her big break when she lands the role of Rachel Zane in the TV drama Suits. As Megan's star power grows, so does her ability to make a difference. You know, a lot of people would just take a comfortable acting job and take the money and, and remain silent and just go to award ceremonies looking nice. She obviously wasn't content with doing that. When she notices the amount of food wasted on the set of suits, she does something about it. Lo and behold, the food suddenly being uh, loaded into vans at the end of the day and taken to nearby homeless shelters. And that was where the nickname Megan Get Shit Done came from on set. The actress starts a lifestyle blog, The Tig, to talk about the things that matter to her. This was a way for her to get creative beyond just being on set and being in suits. She knew what mattered to people. She knew what people wanted to read about. And I think she wanted to share the things that she'd picked up along the way. If you have this kind of job and you have an opportunity to have a profile where people are listening mm -hmm. to what you're saying, I really, truly think you need to be saying something that's valuable. So yes, you can talk about like, where did Rachel get that pencil skirt? Fine. Sure, we can have that conversation, but I'd also like to talk about women's rights. Women's rights and like my work with UN Women or with World Vision or humanitarian trips or just really bolstering self-esteem that has nothing to do with the external. And so for me, that's been really important. I had received an email from a senior advisor at UN Women saying, we love what you're using your platform to do. Would you potentially want to start working with us? She was engaging with philanthropic organizations. She was traveling around the world to promote causes. It doesn't matter what you're doing. I think just any opportunity to help people that have mm -hmm. less than you will change how you move in the world without question. I think everyone should do it. In 2016, Megan travels to Great Britain, where she's set up on a date with a certain strawberry blonde prince. I'd never heard of Megan before, mm -hmm. and I was beautifully surprised when I, when I walked into that room and saw her, and there she was sitting there. I was like, OK, well, I really have to up, up, up my game. <laughs> her looks may turn his head, but it's a shared passion for humanitarian work that holds his attention. One of the first things we started talking about when we met was just the different things that we wanted to do in the world and how passionate we were about seeing change. After just 18 months, Harry and Meghan are engaged, and together they plan to take on the world. I'm so happy. Whatever we have to tackle together or individually will always be us together as a team. So I think I think she's capable it's so of so nicely said, isn't it? I don't know. She's capable of she's capable of anything. It's never been a secret what they together had envisioned for themselves. She might have thought, oh my god, if I get to be married to a prince my voice will be amplified on the international stage. After the wedding, reality sets in. Meghan soon discovers the royal platform comes at a high price. The instructions and the control came thick and fast. She has to give up the life and relative privacy she's enjoyed as an actress. There's nothing to compare royal exposure to. So, you know, there's absolutely no way that she could know what it was like. The acting career has to go. R.I.P. Rachel Zane. She wasn't allowed to keep her job. She wasn't allowed to keep her social media accounts or keep speaking out on all the issues that she cared about. The role silences you without anyone even asking because there is a sort of code of conduct to follow. I remember speaking with some of her friends who felt, oh, we don't really hear Meg's voice anymore. She was sort of given this huge platform, the, the biggest platform she could have dreamed of, and then she wasn't able to use it to talk about the things that she really cared about. While Meghan is silenced, the noise of the media coverage around her is getting louder. Coming up, Meghan's in the tabloid crosshairs, 
every single thing that Meghan did was criticised from day one. But is some of the criticism because of her race? This is British racism. This is what it looks like. When the world first hears in 2016 that Britain's Prince Harry has a new girlfriend, Meghan's mixed race heritage gets a lot of attention. When I first heard that Harry was dating Meghan Markle, I didn't hear that he was dating a outspoken independent feminist role model. I heard that he was dating a black woman, which was very exciting. Certainly, I, people I'd spoke to and never would have ever thought would have had any interest in the royal family uh, became much more interested. And then I saw Meghan and I was like, oh, he's dating um, a very gently black woman. I was like, oh, snap, is this a bit of drama? Is it about to get spicy out here? And it did. Among the excitement, observers see racist undertones to the reporting on Meghan. We saw some piece about, could you imagine this woman with dreadlocks sitting with the Queen for tea? There were the well-known headlines about Meghan being straight out of Compton, which are not only factually inaccurate, but have huge racist undertones that you can't ignore. The reason that people don't like Meghan Markle is not because she's older than Harry, not because she's been married before, it's because she is a bit black. They don't like that little tinge of blackness on Meghan, and that is what has dominated public discussion. Harry and Meghan are not taking it lying down. Harry releases a statement telling the media to back off. The statement says some reporting has crossed the line with abuse and harassment with racial overtones. A member of the royal family coming out and directly using the term racial undertones to the British press is spectacular. I would imagine it's totally unprecedented. To many, the media coverage of Meghan exposes the reality of racism in Britain. As someone from Texas who's been in London for almost three and a half years, I have a lot of discussions about the difference between racism in the US and the UK. We have like different flavors of racism. Like American racism is like very tangy, it's very overt. British racism is usually like an undercurrent. The idea that just because people aren't hanging nooses off of trees and stuff here, that racism isn't happening, is silly. The racism she's experienced, the hate, the abuse, the irrational nonsense of criticism is symptomatic of exactly the lived experience of black people and ethnic minorities in the United Kingdom. If you can get away with doing that to a biracial member of the royal family, Imagine what the rest of us are experiencing. Any challenges Meghan faces because of her race come on top of the already intense experience of marrying into the British royal family. English media coverage of the royals is savage, and it always has been. All royal girlfriends, before they become royal wives, are hounded by the infamous paparazzi. It's almost a rite of passage, an intense public hazing. The truth is, they're savage to all of them. Certainly as a royal, that's part of the job. It should actually be in their, in their contracts. Once royal partners have joined the family and are safely behind palace walls, the media usually backs off for a while. Usually royal wives and new women to the royal family are given this honeymoon period where they can expect to be treated decently by the press. Meghan has barely finished walking down the aisle before the press start throwing shade. Every single thing that Meghan did was criticised from day one. And remember those stories about Duchess Difficult? She wanted things done now. She was deemed a hurricane. It was all too much. If you just listen to the press, that's the impression you got. She's aggressive, she's, she's rude, she's snarky, she's bitchy, diva-ish. That kind of angry black woman is a really clear stereotype that we see. Meghan knew that marrying into the royal family would be difficult, but I think that what she thought of British tabloid culture compared to what it was actually like was very different. When I first met my now husband, my British friend said to me, I'm sure he's great, but you shouldn't do it because the British tabloids will destroy your life. And I very naively, I'm American, we don't have that 
there. What are you talking about? That doesn't make any sense. I'm not in tabloids. I didn't get it. Working as, as family does have its challenges. Of course it does. One of the weapons in the tabloid arsenal is the suggestion Megan is fighting with her sister-in-law, Kate. To pit Kate and Megan against each other in these weird fake quote tabloid wars where like um, Megan said Kate's a real headache. Kate said Megan is insufferable. Meanwhile, William and Harry are just in the back of the room like having a beer like women. Uh <laughs> so everyone loves a cat fight and it's even better when one woman is the good princess and the embodiment of all that is righteous and virtuous in the world. And by definition, the other one is the evil princess. This narrative continues when Meghan announces she's pregnant in October 2018. The media reports on Meghan in a way that contrasts to how they reported on Kate's pregnancies. Kate was described as cradling her bump when she was walking down the street. Meghan was described as kind of showing off. They were like, why can't Meghan Markle keep her hands off her bum? There's the avocado war where, like, Kate, you know, William is serving his beloved Kate avocado to cure her morning sickness. Uh, and then on the flip, you have Meghan Markle, whose beloved avocado uh, has been linked to humanitarian crises. Why was there so much of a backlash against Meghan, but not against Kate? I wonder what that difference could be. Even the birth of baby Archie doesn't put a stop to the critical media coverage. The fact that she was just doing things her own way didn't sit right with traditionalists. They expected her to bring her baby onto the steps of the hospital after, after he was born. By the fall of 2019, on their trip to Africa, it's clear the young family are reaching breaking point. I never thought that this would be easy, but I thought it would be fair. She's tried to fight this tsunami of hate and abuse. At the end of their South Africa tour, they break with tradition and go on the offensive, suing several British tabloid newspapers. We've never seen senior members of the royal family take on the tabloids in a way that Harry and Meghan are doing. I don't think what they're saying is don't scrutinise us. What they're saying is just don't lie about us. Stop the hate and abuse. Coming up... I am here with you as a woman of colour and as your sister. Being Britain's first mixed-race royal also brings challenges inside the palace walls. She's still going to have to listen to people saying the most incredible bullshit and have to keep quiet. A mixed-race woman marrying a senior British royal is unprecedented. Meghan and Harry's wedding feels like a watershed moment in British history. If you ask people 50 years ago whether there'd be a black princess, they would say no. Meghan's mother, Doria Ragland, took her place. It's really great to see, like, an older lady with dreadlocks coming into a royal event and getting given a chair at the front instead of having to clean things up. As a member of the royal family, Meghan's first solo project is launching a charity cookbook with the female survivors of London's Grenfell Tower fire tragedy. Predominantly, the victims of the Grenfell blaze were people of colour. So for her to say that she sees working with them and supporting them in their campaign as being part of her role is distinctly different from the kind of stuff that Kate Middleton or other royal consorts would get up to. She definitely took a slightly different approach. She went to places like Brixton, where I think there are a lot of young uh, people and people of colour who are really excited that a royal will be interested in their communities and what they have to say. I remember meeting a lot of the people in the crowds that day who said, I've never followed the royal family in my life, but Meg's one of us. <laughs> During the couple's tour of South Africa, Meghan connects with her audience in a speech about women's rights. May I just say that while I'm here with my husband as a member of the royal family, I want you to know that for me, I am here with you as a mother, as a wife, as a woman, as a woman of colour, and as your sister. 
Through Megan, it seems this white institution is finally becoming more representative of multicultural Britain. Or is it? It's almost like taking a pint of milk and putting a splash of coffee in it. It might look good for a little bit, but it's not going to make any difference in the long run. As a royal duchess at the top of British society, Meghan is living in a very white world. I know that on the daily, she's going to be dealing with a whole bunch of microaggressions. She's still going to have to listen to people saying the most incredible bullshit and have to keep quiet because she's doing it for the person she loves. I can't speak from the position of marrying into royalty. I can't even speak from the position of dating people with good credit. But what I do recognise is that feeling as a woman of colour, you enter the room and the temperature just drops. Within this very white institution, Meghan is offered little defence from the media storm over tabloid coverage and comments about her race. With the exception of Harry, the royal family sticks to protocol and doesn't get involved. They should have been defending her when she faced struggles that no other royal woman had had to face before. So that silence spoke volumes. Not many people have asked if I'm OK, but it's, um, it's a very real thing to be going through behind the scenes. When Meghan first meets Princess Michael of Kent, the Queen's cousin by marriage, the royal is wearing a Blackamoor brooch. Blackamoor jewellery features exoticised African figures. It was popular in the 17th century, but is now widely seen as culturally insensitive, if not racist. If you're a royal and you're meeting the mixed race fiance of Prince Harry, what story do you think that Blackamoor brooch is telling? To wear something like that shows an insensitivity to Meghan's biracial heritage. Princess Michael later apologises and says it was a brooch she has worn many times before. Let's look at uh, royals and fashion. Every little thought goes into every detail. We can go by what she says, that she knew nothing behind the meaning of it, but I wonder if there was something more to it. And that, for me, is always going to be much more revealing than how they behaved when all the cameras of the world were on them. I feel like Meghan Markle's cameo inside the royal family has like been watching the sequel to Get Out. It's just like the entire time I see pictures of her in the press or I see footage of her in an interview, I'm like, what are you doing? You're in the sunken place. You need to leave. For 18 months, Meghan silently endures the media attacks and awkward social moments. Until October 2019, when she does something that royals rarely do. She admits she's struggling. You know, I, I, I've said for a long time to H, that's what I call him. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> um, it's not enough to just survive something, right? Like, that's not the point of life. You've got to thrive. Things escalate fast from there. And three months later... Tonight's announcement by Harry and Meghan came as quite a shock. They intend to step back as senior members of the royal family. I think Britain thought it was ready to embrace a mixed-race princess or duchess. But it wasn't. Coming up, what will Mexit really mean for Meghan and Harry? It's not all going to stop. People aren't going to be like, OK, you've left, you're in Canada, fine. We won't bother you at all. January 2020, and the news hits that Meghan and Harry want to step back from being senior royals. When I found out that Harry and Meghan were taking a step back, I was like, oh shit, she got him. <laughs> when I heard the announcement, I was surprised because I didn't think uh, you could do that kind of deal. I thought it was a kind of like, I'm going to sign my name in the Book of the Beast kind of thing, um, till death do us part. I didn't realize how much of a backlash there would be. It's not casual to be like, actually, Grandma, I'd like to not be in the family business anymore. The British royal family is losing two of its most popular members. But was it ever going to end any other way? I don't know how much abuse you can really expect people to take. When it comes to being Meghan, 
I have no idea how you stay mentally resilient in the face of that onslaught, knowing that your in-laws are unsupportive. As much as she joined a royal family, this is also her life, you know? It's her, it's her existence, and now it's her child, you know? They've made their decision, but it's not a simple case of just jetting off into the Canadian sunset. Like Brexit, Megxit is going to take some negotiation. While Meghan stays in Canada with Archie, Harry remains in the UK to negotiate with the Queen, AKA grandmother. And of course, the sticking point is money. I don't think it's sad. They can go and live their own lives as they want, just not have us pay for it. If the British taxpayer is paying for something, they want value for money. The British public don't like to feel cheated particularly when it comes to their royal family. Why? Because we pay for the royal family. The British taxpayer largely funds their lifestyles. So how is the royal family funded? Let's find out. As we now know, being a royal is a job, and the British taxpayer pays them for their work. They cover their travel, their security, and things like the two and a half million pound refurbishment of Meghan and Harry's mansion, Frogmore Cottage. In exchange, the British public expects royals to cut ribbons, open parliament and send royal baby pics on the reg. But Meghan and Harry want out. And if they're not working, they're not getting paid. So, in exchange for their freedom, Meghan and Harry will lose their monthly paycheck, pay rent on Frogmore Cottage and must pay back the cost of its refurbishment. Bet they wish they went for cheaper tiles. Once that's all ironed out, and with the Queen's blessing, it's time for Harry to say goodbye to his old life. From all the coverage, you might think the royal family has never seen anything like this. You don't have to go back very far to see otherwise. In 1993, Harry's mother, Princess Diana, famously retires from public life. I will be reducing the extent of the public life I've led so far. Just like Harry and Meghan, this is largely due to the unrelenting media attention. I was not aware of how overwhelming that attention would become, nor the extent to which it would affect both my public duties and my personal life. And Diana isn't the first to throw off the shackles of royal life. Meghan and Harry's departure from the royal family is an abdication in all but name. Abdication means giving up the throne and all the royal accoutrements that come with it. That has led to all sorts of comparisons with Edward VIII and Wallace Simpson. In 1936, then King of England, Edward VIII chooses to quit being king to trot off and marry Wallace Simpson, an American divorcee. But the idea of a British royal marrying an American woman who has been married before is unheard of. It causes a massive scandal. The only way he can be with his one true love is to abdicate, leaving the throne to his brother, George VI. That's the Queen's dad. Harry isn't going to be king. He wasn't destined to be king. But this idea of a senior member of the royal family leaving the family for love and for the love of an American woman and a divorcee at that, well, the comparisons are clear. Luckily, Harry doesn't have to abdicate. He's brokered himself a deal, so it's go time for his and Meghan's great escape. But can a member of the royal family ever truly be free? They won't be as free as you and me. Like, nobody gives a shit about us. I think Meghan should go live her best life, get a bath bomb, teach Harry how to make chicken properly with seasoning. It's as free as the most famous couple in the world could be. It's not all gonna stop. People aren't gonna be like, okay, you've left, you're in Canada, fine. We won't bother you at all. Coming up, what lies ahead for Harry and Meghan? They have unlimited potential. They could earn a uh, million dollars per Instagram post. Harry and Meghan are free. Forget the traditional fairy tale. This prince and princess are writing their own happy ending. What that looks like, we don't know yet. What we do know, the first thing they do is move to Canada. 
in this country, there is really a profound sense of privacy and the right to it. I think it was very telling that, you know, one of the water taxi people in Victoria refused to drive journalists out on the water to take photographs of the royal's house. And he said it was because it was a violation of their privacy. A life away from prying cameras. That's the dream, right? But beyond that, what are they going to do? Because they've said they want to pay their own way. The question is where they're going to make their money from um, and how much. I think they have unlimited potential. There has been so much speculation about what their potential worth will be. OK, so let's speculate. If we look at the a model already set by the Obamas, they now uh, fund their lives with clever speaking engagements. The couple have already started giving speeches at private events, so this could be a lucrative option. There's talk about them setting up their own production company. Wired said that they could earn a uh, million dollars per Instagram post. They could make literally tens of millions of dollars every year for random celebrity nonsense. What brand wouldn't want their endorsement? Even Harry's little-known cousin, Peter Phillips, has fronted a TV advert for a milk company in China. I'm Peter Phillips. I love milk. He's a businessman. There's a brand there, and he's making the most of it. Without question, they'll do the same. I think they'll be very successful. This is what I drink. I hope it's not milk. I mean, can we not go some a bit more sophisticated, like champagne or something? Milk, please. Whatever's ahead, it will be very different from the world they've left behind. I mean, they must be so relieved not to have to give a damn anymore about the rules and the courtiers and the ghastly family ways. I mean, that must be very liberating. You know, everyone criticizes the royal family or they criticize the British press, but, like, the person they should really be criticizing is the British public. Like, the British public feels totally entitled to annihilate these people. I would not expect anybody in public life to tolerate the level of abuse that Harry and Meghan were going through. I'm sorry, no amount of money is worth your dignity. Meghan Markle joining the royal family was meant to be a watershed moment, a chance to prove Britain's monarchy could embrace change. I think in the future, historians will look back on this as the biggest missed opportunity for the royal family that they've ever had. Fundamentally, it wasn't an opportunity that they were going to take. They don't want to change. That's not the brand. You can't modernize something that is inherently regressive, inherently nostalgic, inherently just old. Meghan and Harry are just starting to write the next chapter of their life story. We'll all have to wait to find out what it says. Personally, I think the happy ending for Meghan and Harry is already starting. They don't want to have their son waking up every single morning and reading scathing articles about his mother. I'm like, be the millennial queen that we need you to be. Put your self-care first. I hope for the happy ending that she and Harry wish for themselves. And um, they should go get it. And they should not give a flying flamingo what anybody thinks. A fairy tale is when anyone finds their partner and lives a happy life. And I still believe that they can do that. <laughs>